thank you for inviting me to speak in this session. And also thanks for still figuring out ways to make this possible, even with what's going on right now in the world. Today, I would like to talk to you about work that we're doing as part of the Advanced Geo Partnership Project. My name is Asmard Asafal Burhe. Uh, I'm one of the co-PIs in the project, along with um, the list of authors that you see on the screen. And today, I want to specifically talk to you about empowering geoscientists to improve diversity and inclusion in our scientific field. Um, and I'm going to give some general observations about trends that exist um, in our community right now, and then draw on our um, uh, experience from the Advanced Geo program uh, to promote institutional and cultural change. Let's start by highlighting that um, the issue of lack of diversity in the geosciences is a persistent one. Here I'm showing you data from NSF Survey of Earned Directorates that basically shows that the number of PhD recipients in the U.S. that identified as either Hispanic, Latino, or Black, or African American has can remain roughly the same um, at about five to six percent, and then a number of the proportion of PhD recipients that identified as American Indian and, or Alaska Native has remained less than 1% since 2009. And if you zoom in into the geosciences in the 2018 data set that's now available online, you notice that 80% of the PhD recipients identified as white um, and very small proportions identified as being members of uh, these underrepresented uh, groups. Um, to highlight how dire this problem is, in this box on your right, I have actually given the actual number of people that from these groups that actually received PhDs in 2018. Only 11 Black people received PhDs in geosciences. And remember, this is across wide areas of Earth, ocean, and atmospheric sciences that I've listed at the bottom here. Only three of PhD recipients in the areas of geoscience identified um, as American Indian, Alaska Native, um, and about 49 as Hispanic or Latino. So this problem is dire and is also persisted for long period of time. The issue of persistent lack of diversity in the geosciences is even more dire when we look at the data on women, and especially women of color, where um, women make up a very small proportion of faculty in geoscience departments across academic institutions in the US, um, typically less than 20% overall for women and less than 7% for women of color across wide fields of earth, atmospheric, and uh, oceanic sciences. And the other important trend that shows up in the data is that there's significant attrition of women at every stage in their careers. This con persistent problem of lack of diversity in the geosciences was very nicely articulated in a paper in Geosci Nature Geosciences in 2018 where you see that um, with multiple efforts that went into diversifying academic programs over four decades, there's been very little to no change in diversity of who's receiving PhDs and who's occupying um, higher ranks in geoscience fields across the country, um, even after 40 years. It's important to note that many geoscience departments, even today, still have no faculty or students of color, in particular women of color. That's often told to explain away this persistent lack of diversity in the geosciences is that there just aren't enough members of underrepresented groups um, to recruit um, or even retain in academic institutions. Uh, the president of Pomona College, Dr. Starr, gave a poignant response to Purdue's president when he referred to black scholars as rare creatures in one of these efforts to explain away lack of diversity. Um, and she stated that this idea that scholars of color are rare is a damaging fiction that is unfortunately common in academic circles, though it's continuously repeated by at academic um, administrators and used as an excuse to not pursue people of color in particular. Um, and obviously this has multiple consequences because it not only um, can perpetuates this persistent lack of 
diversity, but it even makes younger scholars think that it's impossible to ever lead in this community, right? It, it has the consequence of leading to loss of creativity, delayed discoveries, um, and fewer transformative ideas that the world desperately needs right now. Um, and of course, it helps maintain the status quo uh, because it, it negates or ignores the fact that scholars from underrepresented groups are intentionally minoritized by the structures um, that are inherent in academic institutions. I need to note here that our academic institutions are set up with institutional structures, practices, behaviors that continue to exclude certain segments of society. Um, our institutions are built on long legacies of patriarchal or colonial systems that were intentionally set up to exclude certain segments of society, in particular women and people of color. And so the history of how our institutions were, were set up and who was allowed to have an influence in our academic communities were people that look like those on these relatively old pictures that you see on the screen. And this is true for both field-based geosciences, for example, as well as lab-based fields in the geosciences. Um, even many years after these pictures were taken, you would still be hard pressed to find a very inclusive and diverse field of geosciences um, that is diverse, representative, and inclusive in not just how in, in representation of members of different communities, but also in terms of the power uh, structures um, that set up the culture and set the standards for um, how we conduct ourselves in this academic community. Times when this persistent lack of diversity in academic fields and institutions is discussed, um, a lot of folks invoke this idea of a leaky pipeline to explain um, how there is significant attrition at every career stage for women and people of color in general. And, and I have a bit of a problem with this metaphor because it portrays this issue as this passive loss of people that I you know that are members of underrepresented groups or women from the academic community um, just because they can't make it or because they're um, not interested in this field and it ignores the fact that um, when women in underrepresented communities um, enter our field they tend to experience considerable lack of support, bias, harassment, and discrimination, which I think is more accurately represented by a vicious obstacle course metaphor than it is by a leaky pipeline metaphor. A lot of published research over the last few decades has explained how the playing field is not level when it comes to women and underrepresented groups in STEM fields, but academic and scholarly work in general. Um, as the existing biases and discriminations in community in general manifest as inequities at pretty much every level, of uh, scholarly education um, and fields. It shows up in how uh, students are mentored differently depending on their race or gender, shows up in terms of how job applications are evaluated, reference letters are written and evaluated, how we decide salary scales and startup costs for folks entering academic institutions in terms of who gets access to research facilities, who gets invitations to be referees for journal articles or proposals, who gets speaking invitations and awards, who even gets nominated for those awards, um, who gets uh, named professorships, um, and who's doing the invisible labor that does not get due recognition in academic institutions, for example. Um, and the same patterns are observed also when you look at data on who's um, publishing and recognized with prestigious publications. Um, and important here to remind folks that the citations that are colored in blue are all citations 
from fields um, that are geo in geosciences. So they're very specific to our community. Um, when So when we talk about this vicious obstacle course for women and underrepresented folks, I think it's important to remember that the path um, is complicated at multiple levels and there is inequities that are entering into the picture again at multiple levels. The Advanced Geo Partnership is a national partnership that's funded by the National Science Foundation and includes researchers from across the US, including researchers from large primarily white institutions um, and minority serving institutions, including both public and private schools, as well as large R1 schools and all the way to small liberal arts schools. Um, all of these researchers are working in partnership with professional associations, in particular the Earth Science Women's Network, the Association of Women Geoscientists, and the American Geophysical Union, um, again in partnership to empower geoscientists to be able to transform workplace climate and improve equity, diversity, and inclusion across all areas of geosciences. The Advanced Geo Partnership was set up with four major goals to develop and deliver by standard intervention and workplace climate training with specific uh, discipline specific scenarios, especially into geosciences um, that also incorporate intersectionality. Uh, set up to collect data on workplace climates in the geosciences, uh, which we've successfully done and continue to do. Uh, also develop teaching modules that identify harassment as research misconduct for our community and develop a sustainable model of how to transform workplace climate that can be transferred to other disciplines in partnership with professional societies. I, just a few of the uh, ways that the Advanced Geo Partnership has been working to transform workplace climates in the geosciences. To date, um, we have reviewed a large number of existing programs, conducted, again, many workshops and presentations across the country and even internationally in academic institutions, professional society meetings, and other venues with the goal of training a large number of our community members in bystander intervention, as well as um, think about how we can all work with a common goal to transform workplace climate. Uh, we built relationships with campus administrators and programs, um, and even helped some develop uh, codes of conduct uh, for field work, for departments and other um, institutional programs. We've generated a large online resource base on relevant research and tested strategies to improve workplace climate and made that freely available on a resource that I'm going to present in the next page. Um, we've now conducted a large climate survey um, where we've, we are getting data on uh, and analyzing currently data on workplace climates and the type, form, magnitude um, of issues that geoscientists that identify across um, many um, of diversity access uh, have experienced uh, geoscience workplaces. Uh, the model and the approach that we've taken so far that emphasize bystander intervention, empowering geoscientists to transform workplace um, has been, I think if we might say, pretty successful and well sought after um, and is now being expanded to ecology, animal behavior, evolutionary biology, neuroscience, chemistry, sociology, psychology, and political science, among uh, some fields that are even others that might be coming up, which is to say that it's been successful in one of, in uh, we've been successful in our goals to um, empower our scientific community to help with transforming the workplace climate, which we believe is a major step for diversifying our community as well as ensuring equity and inclusion uh, for uh, our entire scientific community.
as I mentioned in the last slide, we have now compiled a very rich resource base that's freely available to the community on multiple topics that you see on the screen, um, both academic and legal resources, uh, as well as data um, and information on how to develop codes of conduct, how to conduct training that, to respond to hostile behaviors, and how we can all work towards creating inclusive climates, including by learning about diversity and bias, um, and also how we can report these things when they do happen in our institutions. Um, all of these resources, again, are freely available on the web, and they're hosted at the CERC site in Carleton College, um, and the website that uh, you could use to access this resource again freely is on the screen in red, cerf.carlton.edu forward slash advanced geo. Conclusion, I would like to state that what we've learned from the advanced geo partnership work that we've been doing is that building a more inclusive and diverse geoscience community will require that we simultaneously address a number of key factors that have been responsible for perpetuating inequity, bias, discrimination, and harassment in our scholarly communities. And this means we have a lot of work to do, including do better to acknowledge the history of our discipline and the institutions. We have to, again, do better to decolonize our curriculum so that we're teaching our students effectively using inclusive educational approaches that enrich their academic training and experiences. We have to do better to empower scholars to take charge of our, of our own mentoring, in particular uh, for early career scholars, so that they are able to identify people that will support them through a range of the um, mentoring needs that typically every member of our academic community has at one point or another, but also develop a team of sponsors that will also uh, be effective advocates later in their careers. We also have to prioritize safety and address unethical treatment in hostile work cli cli workplace climates. We have to make it clear that we will not tolerate harassment and discrimination in our communities. We also have to avoid narrow definitions of scientific success and recognize work that's done to empower our community in particular to help improve um, our workplace climates to serve everyone um, in the best ways possible. With that, I'd like to say thank you and you can learn a lot more about our Advanced Geo project by visiting the website or following us on Twitter at Advanced Geo. Thank you.